Hey, welcome back to the podcast. I am super excited to share this individual with you. If you are a CEO of a company, you know who he is. If you're in the MLS business, the mortgage business, uh, pretty much anybody in a high level position in the real estate world knows the name Stefan Swampool. He has done, well, I'll tell you a little backstory. 2004, my team and I, we start this company and we are so excited. We do our first conference call back in 2004 to announce to the world that the new Tom Ferry company exists. And maybe two or three days later, I get a phone call and I, I, I know who this person is, but we've never interacted. And he said, look, we're down the street. Let's go walk Balboa Island together. I'd like to get to know you. I want to talk to you about, you know, the future of real estate and where's everything going. And I was like, I mean, this guy's a legend, right? So I was like, well, yeah, of course, let's go. And we walked the island and I got to know his backstory his understanding of the real estate world of every you know piece of the real estate business around the world and very quickly found him to be someone that I could call mentor someone that I could say I can learn a lot from this guy because when I remember getting back to the office that day my team's like how was the meeting like you know you're with Stefan like what was that like and I'm like if there was a real estate library card that I had to you know go check out all the information on the real estate industry I can throw that card away because I now know this guy because he studied it that much. So I am super pumped to have him on the podcast. Of course, now we're finding him at his beautiful home in Hawaii. So if you're watching this on video, you see the beautiful 18th green of the golf course that he's uh, he's at. So Stefan, uh, I would say, you know, good afternoon here, but good morning in, uh, in Hawaii. Thanks for joining me on the podcast. <laughs> Good morning, Tom. Yes, it's still morning here in, in the North Shore of Kauai and good afternoon to uh, California and the rest of the country and your huge following that uh, I'm sure have dialed into this call or will be listening afterwards. So good morning, everyone. Yes. Uh, happy COVID. Yeah, exactly. I like that. Happy COVID. So, Stefan, so much of this podcast, so, you know, you know, I have, I have a lot of different content that I put out, but a year and three months ago, we said, you know, we got to do a podcast, right? We got to just, you know, acknowledge that there's this, this huge segment of the market that wants it just audio first, even though this is video and everything else. Um, and it's been fun because we talk a lot about the entrepreneurial journey. And, and, you know, whether it's with a friend of mine who started Nectar or Mauricio, who I just, you know, interviewed on how he built the agency, you know, or any one of the other extraordinary people that I'm blessed to get to know. For the people that don't know you and don't know your backstory, would you take just a minute and, and help them understand why I would say I threw my real estate library card away when I met Stefan? Like, where were you born? Where are you from? How did you get into real estate? And I know it's a, it, that's a long question for you, but give us some context. Oh my goodness. Not a, not a fun topic for me to discuss uh, myself. Um, the short story is I was born into a diplomatic family where my father was an ambassador. Uh, and just like a military family, every six years got stationed in another country. And uh, I was born in the 50s. Um, I was, he, my dad at that time was stationed in East Africa in Kenya. I always joke and say I was probably born down the street from Obama, but what do I know? <laughs> because I have no idea. But anyway, so so um, uh, was it? We were in Kenya for eight years. Uh, then, when the Mau Mau uprise came and the country became independent in the early '60s, we were evac'd out under under severe stress. Uh, we moved to Hong Kong. We lived in Hong Kong for most of the '60s, from the early to the end '60s. Uh, you also had the Hong Kong virus in 1968, which killed a million people. But we were there in the late '60s. My dad got stationed in South Africa. We landed up in South Africa, and that's where I finished high school uh, and went to university and got my bachelor's in, in uh, engineering and a master's in uh, strategic planning and business administration. So uh, by the time I was there, I like I like South Africa a lot, but I wasn't really, really, really a true South African because we had we've moved around and I wasn't born there. Uh, by the time I was in South Africa, I was speaking four languages. I was speaking Swahili and Chinese and English and Dutch, which is the South African dialect of it, version of Dutch. So I, I was a confused kid. <laughs> I mean, I, I wasn't quite sure where home was. And although, although um, home is, of course, where the heart is and where the family is, by the time I started going to university, I was looking for where would I, where would I end up one day? And uh, when I was in, in, in high school, beginning university, I wrote down 10 goals for me in life. And... Uh, I achieved uh, all 10 of them by the age of 36, and then I wrote down 10 more, and the Hawaii house, which you're looking at, which is my vacation home, is my last, my last one of my second list of 10. So I've, I've set 20 life goals for me, which I started at the age of 18, and I have checked every single one off. 
but it is not because I'm great. It's simply just determination and will and, and drive. And I made sure that those goals were not, they're not just business driven. Yes, there is a, a good 25% that is business related, but I made sure that 25% was, was personal and family related. 25% was actually a religion and, and weight. And yeah, there was 25% about writing. I wanted to be a New York Times bestseller even when I was 18. So, so I, I had a variety of different things on the list. And those were just, they're not important things. They're important things to me to define who I was. So by the time I had uh, finished as an engineer, I was working an engineer, I one day saw an advertisement in a, in a financial magazine which said, CEO of the National Association of Realtors in South Africa. And I thought, what is a realtor? I, I don't even know what a realtor is. I mean, what right. is this? And I looked at the job description. It said, travel internationally, which of course I, I love very much. But it said, meet the president, change the laws, write exams, do education, go to seminars, do conventions, you know, write the guidebook. And I thought, wow, as an engineer, I'm never, ever, ever, ever going to do any of that. Um, again, kind of start a long story short, I didn't apply for the job, but a friend of mine threw my hat in the ring, unbeknownst to me. Nine months, 200 interviews later, I got the job at the age of 26 and became the head of NAR for Southern Africa. And that took me out of engineering in one foul swoop and dumped me into the real estate industry, which I think... Tom, it was an instant love affair. I mean, I, yes. I, I, I don't really want to sell real estate. I have. Um, I've been an agent. I've been a broker. I don't really like it. I don't want to be that. But I love the industry and the people. And, and because of my engineering background, I think I love uh, logic and common sense and statistics and numbers and analysis. So as I got into the industry, I found there was an absence of facts. Yes. yes. <laughs> An absolute of, of, of documentation that everybody could have access to. I agree. What that's real and accurate. I mean, our industry does thrive on a lot of BS. Our industry does thrive on, on self-promotion and, and, and big statements. So, now, everybody always wants to be the first, the only, the best, the most unique, right? So, so as I progress through life, and I've, I've now run a brokerage company three times. I've been CEO of a national franchise with you know, over 28,000 agents. Um, I have run a training company. I have run an MLS. And if I say run, I don't mean as part of the team. I mean as CEO. I mean, mm -hmm. since, since the age of 26, it's the only position I've ever had in my life. I mean, CEO, president, chairman. I mean, that's all I do. So I have led different aspects of our industry. Again, franchise, brokerage, MLS association. Um, uh, and about 20 years ago, after having done most of that, those things, and I, I think um, feeling very self-satisfied that I understood the space. I felt it was time to pursue that dream to try and create the backbone of the industry from a analytical, statistical point of view, mainly for, for everybody, but for myself as well. I, I, I mean, I, I have a need to understand. I have a, yes. a need to understand why something works. And if I know the knowledge, I will gladly share it. The same as I shared it with you, I will honestly share it with everybody. I don't believe information should be locked away. Um, we, we, we give a lot of information at T360 away. Yes, we do sell some because at the end of the day, we have to also pay the bills like everybody else. So we do sell some of our very, very uh, in-depth studies. But I would say 80% of our research is actually complimentary and given away. If, if you just want average information and normal information, we'll give it to you free. If you really want to be ahead of the crowd, if you want to be in the top five or ten percent, you want to you want to know things before anybody else wants. You want special attention. Well, that's going to cost you because it's going to take hours and hours of my time. Right, right. So you covered a lot of ground, and I don't know if you noticed, but I'm actually taking notes. Yes, I saw. So, I'm so of that. Knowing, knowing you as long as I have, I, I just have to ask this question because I've seen you interview so many people on stage, and you are uh, a phenomenal interviewer. Um, do you get nervous being interviewed? No, I, I think the first time I got nervous was at the age of 26 when I took over as CEO of, of the association and all my employees and 90% of my members were younger than I was. And I think that first step at 26 when you become somebody and, and yet you're nobody, um, yes, I was unsure and, and I stepped carefully and it felt as if you were being scrutinized for everything you do. But, you know, if, if you go back and say that was the, you know, the early 80s, my goodness, Tom, that's four, we're now almost going to five decades ago. 
I have done so many talks, so many interviews, live video of, of both right. sides of the camera. Uh, to me today, it's, it's almost natural. I, I don't want to say I didn't prepare for your call here, but I didn't. It's you and me yes. talking here. You exactly. can ask me anything you want. I'm an open book and I'm comfortable. Yes. And like, like so many of the extraordinary people I've gotten to know in my life, you have a memory like like not many people I know, like you can, you can pull data points and stats and facts and, oh, that was trend number, you know, seven of, you know, uh, you know, trend book number four, right? Like it's extraordinary. Not that I'm going to, you know, attack you and all that stuff, but I do, I want to go back to, I think it's interesting. You're 18 years old and you write down 10 goals for yourself. Where, where did goal setting become normal for you? Like that, you don't hear that from many 18 year olds. And, and I'm curious, like, what were those goals? Yeah, I, I have them all against my wall here, you know, why I frame them. I, I don't know why I have been asked that question many times, and I honestly don't know. I don't, you know, I, 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 I've lost both my parents because they died of, 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 of my dad died of old age uh, recently. But, but so it's, and, and I, I don't think it's from them. They were not very, very ambitious people. Uh, they were great parents. I loved them to death. They provided me a, a life and an opportunity on all levels that I could not ask for more. But they did not push me or direct me or challenge me really to do more. Um, and my dad was, although he was a diplomat for many years in his life, he was he was a government servant. I mean, we weren't we weren't rich. We weren't poor by any stretch. I mean, we we did not have a shortage of anything. But we weren't we weren't rich. We didn't have you know multiple cars and multiple houses. We lived like you know mid, mid America, maybe slightly upper class. Um, so, so I I don't know. Uh, you know. the best I could say it's probably in my DNA. It's probably just who I am. Uh, I am a very 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 focused person, a very deliberate person. I don't kid around easily. I don't make sarcastic comments easily. I I'm not negative. I don't say negative things. I don't need to prove myself to anybody. I have proven myself to myself over and over. I know who I am. I am super comfortable with who I am. Yeah. And um, so for me, life is, life is not hard. Uh, life has challenges and many, 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 many of them. And many times you're dealt a bad hand. And sometimes, you know, somebody does something against you. And, and yes, we all have sad days. But, uh, any kind of, of loss of, of family, friends, accidents, cars, businesses. I mean, there are hundreds of reasons why you can have a day that just absolutely sucks the wind out of everything, right? Yes. But I really believe that the majority of things in your life, Tom, and the majority of things in my life, we control or we largely control or we significantly influence or we can do it so that it has a higher probability of outcome the way we desire it to be. I get it that if you say, well, Stefan, can you fly? No, of course I can't fly. And of course I, I can't do anything. But, but within reality, within reason, there's nothing I don't believe Tom Ferry can't do. I don't believe there's anything I can't do. And therefore, if I believe of that of you and me, I have to believe that of your kids and my kids. I have to believe that of the people on this call today. Yes, it's gonna take sacrifice. Yes, sometimes it's way harder than what you thought. Sometimes you go like, you know, I just hate Tom Ferry because he made me do this. Yeah, he's trying to teach you a new habit. He's trying to, he's trying to put you on a path where you're hopefully not gonna bump your toe the second or the third or the fourth time against the same Thing that you could have noticed. I like to have a, you know, a plan A for everything as I, I would like to think everybody else has. But Tom, I have a, I have a plan B, C, and D. Yes. And for most of my plans, like at the moment, we're on plan B of plan B of plan A. Because plan A didn't work. We had a plan B, but we didn't, we didn't think of Corona. We didn't know of COVID, but we no. had a disaster plan. So yeah. then we had to go to plan B of plan B of plan A. So is that strange? No, no, it's not a normal day, but it's not the end of the world. I have a plan B at the moment for my plan B of plan B of plan A. So, so I'm ready if something else happens. If, if this lasts another three months, it's going to be terrible. But will we be through it? Oh, without a shadow of a doubt. Yes. I know the upside is coming. I know the stock market is returning. I know the real estate market is returning. As I know that the sun's going to come up next week or this week. I know it. Now, yes. when? Of course, I don't know. The Trump or CDC or the World Health Organization or a Governor Newsom that opens up the borders or, or whatever they do or, or allow people to get back. All of those are small influences which change the surroundings around me, which change my chessboard. It moves the chess pieces around. Bingo. But I'm still playing chess. You're not playing chess. I, I mean, I'm playing my life chess. So mm -hmm. I'm in charge of my chess game. Yes, 
somebody might make a move against me, which I'm disappointed or I'm, I'm heartbroken or it hurts, so I lose a couple of grand. Eh, damn it. Okay, next one. But I'm in, I'm in charge of my life's chess game, and I, I will win. I will not come second. We could just stop the podcast right there and just go, mic drop. <laughs> so, Stefan, I understand this because, you know, you you know my parents, right? You know my dad. Like, like you know, I was that kid who barely got out of high school, yada, yada. Everyone knows the story. But I finally decided, like, hey, you know what? I think I want to, I want something more in my life. And I've been, I've been that obsessive, you know, some would even argue over planner, over strategy, plan A, B, C, D. So when you're saying that, like you're speaking my language, how does the person that's listening to this right now, who, who really felt caught off guard by this, that the market's been so frothy for a decade in housing and truthfully, you know, not, not necessarily globally, but the U S economy has been so frothy for a decade that they didn't need to plan. And now all of a sudden they're being forced to, what advice do you have for that person to just keep them coming back to do a little more, to do a little more planning and not take all this so damn personally. You can't be so damn arrogant to think you never should plan. You should plan always. You don't plan just for a bad time. My goodness, you plan for a good time. Yeah. You should see the spreadsheet I built when my family and I go on vacation. I mean, we, we plan this baby out and you can talk. You you know both my sons, right? You've met yes. them, you've worked with them, you've actually, you know, Brilliant. Worked, you, yeah. you've participated in one of their business. We actually have genuinely a spreadsheet for vacation. Now you would say, Stefan, you should do things on the, on the spur of the moment. Of course we do. We plan it on the plan and call it spur of the moment. And then we do what we want to do at that time because we don't know what to do because we plan spur of the moment. But, <laughs> but things don't go wrong or don't happen. We, my kids don't have a great 16th or 20th or 30th birthday because it just accidentally happened. Yes. If, if, if I care for you, Tom, if I care for my kids, which of course you know I do, if I care for my wife, which would be this year, by the way, 40 years of marriage. So if you care, if you care for somebody, I, I care for Jack Miller, my partner, Yes. Right. So if you care for the people on your team and around you, would you not try and make their life, their decisions, their circumstances as, as easy, as fortuitous, as positive as you possibly can within your power? And I think we would all say absolutely. So to do that, I would have a plan. And yes, I, I do understand that one can over plan. And I'm sure people think that you over plan. There's no doubt that people say that I over plan. Um, but, but, you know, if you have a plan and life has a choice of going uh, any way, you know, any way but lose, or it goes the way you planned it, it probably will rather go the way you planned it to a large extent. And if it does, isn't the way you planned it better than being caught off guard? So for the good times, I do have a plan. For the bad times, I have, you know, a plan with a backup plan. Yeah. Um, you don't have to create thousands of pages. My backup plans are not, you know, not even 20 pages. But yeah, you would say to yourself, I, I need a pick a number. I don't know what the number is, Tom, but you know, I need a hundred thousand. I need 500,000. I need a million dollars in a savings account for a rainy day, right? Whatever you want to build yourself, maybe it's 10 grand. It doesn't matter, but, but you plan for a rainy day. So, so when, when this happened, Jack and I sat down, we looked at each other and we said, we'll take the example. We'll take a 50% pay cut uh, in our company because we can, because we, we planned for it. Now we didn't plan for Corona this year, No. but we had planned to make ourselves financially strong enough that if something happened that I did not, that you did not, that he did not have to worry that we would have to lay staff off. We at T3 have not laid off one staff member and we have given every single one the confirmation that we have 100% intent of not laying anybody off this year, not one. We will do whatever it takes to power through. And we said, we think it's 60, to 120 days. And we will adjust that number if we have to. The 60 days, of course, is basically coming to an end the end of this month and 120 days is at the end of July. And we're opening back our offices on June 1. Now, we're not quite at full strength yet. We'll probably be coming to the office with masks. We'll, everybody has their own office. We'll have social distancing. Uh, that's an insignificant hurdle. We'll overcome that, that's nothing. Yeah. Got to plan ahead. You've got to plan ahead. Everything, yeah. everything. You know and I would just reiterate for everybody listening right now, um, you know, some of you are, you know, some of you are listening, you're like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. Like they just, they, they know they are in control of their destiny, that they get to decide that they are the captain. 
and others still have that experience of like, you know, and, and listen, if you're, if you're that person, I'm not, I'm not dogging you. I'm telling you, you got a choice. You get a choice. You get to decide like how it's going to be. And you, you may not be able to have control of all of the, the chessboard, but you can control what you do tomorrow morning, how you wake up, what you eat, what you don't eat, what you do, the call you make, the email you send. You got to take those little bite-sized pieces of control and start building that momentum, right? I, I tweeted out a couple of days ago, Stefan, like the world may be in crisis, but you don't have to be right. Focus on what you can control and that it, it's almost cliche, but you know, that is the message, right? Yeah, it does sound cliche, Tom. And, and I know, I know a, a coach and a, and, a, and a mentor and, and somebody who has it good when we give this advice, it does sound cliche. I, I get it. I mean, yeah. I, I have the same feeling sometimes. Yep. I feel I feel guilty as hell sitting here in a beautiful house in Hawaii. I mean, I feel as if I've sinned doing something wrong. And, yeah. and I know I haven't. I haven't. I mean, the, the money wasn't stolen. It wasn't gone in bad ways. I've, it's, a, it's a 40 year goal, which I've worked on. We bought the property, I don't know, seven years ago. I designed the house myself. I mean, we, we searched for the property for two years. I didn't start building now. I started building three years ago. So it's a, it's a process. So it's not luck, but it is, you said baby steps, small steps. I really appreciate it when you say that because I'm a strong believer life is not black and white, right? Decisions are not black and white. I understand you're pregnant or you're not. I understand one plus one is two, but those are, those are hard scientific facts. The, the majority of life's decisions, oh, they are somewhere in that gray, gooey, messy middle, oh, yeah. right? It, yeah. it is hard sometimes. It, it's not hard being ethical or, or moral when the policeman is standing over your shoulder. Will you do the right thing when nobody's watching You'll never tell anybody, nobody will ever see and you can get away with it and you won't be none the wiser. Will you still do the right thing at that time, right? <laughs> In the quiet behind closed doors. So, so take baby steps. If somebody's overwhelmed by what I say, I apologize. I, that's not my intent and I know it's not yours as well. We don't want to come across overbearing. Break life into, into pieces. Yeah. Look at one chess piece at a time. If you can't see the whole board, that's okay. I, I can, you can, and I, I don't want to be a coach. I, I've said you many times, many people have said to me, why don't I become a coach? I, I don't want to be a coach. I, I, I love the, the analysis and the research which we do. I'm leaving the coaching to, to you and to the other industry people that do it so well. So, so you've got the time to be a, co a, a coach and, and patient with people. But take the pieces of your life, your business, break it up into the co compartmental sizes that you can handle. Yes. Some can handle more. Tom Ferry can juggle five balls at a time and the average person can juggle two balls and I maybe do six balls and Jack Miller does maybe four balls. It doesn't matter. Take whatever you can take and juggle that until you become comfortable and then gradually add one. You don't have to go from one to six tomorrow. You don't have to beat me or Tom Ferry. Tom Ferry and I are not your competitors. You have to beat the other lazy son of a bitch agent across the road, right? You have to beat the other agent who's doing little or nothing yes so the the level for you to succeed is not as high as you think it is <laughs> i mean yeah. you have to do the right things yes but, but, yes but you're not fighting mark zuckerberg you're not fighting apple or microsoft you're fighting regular agents that find life and business as hard as you're finding it bingo um, bingo it's doable it's doable yeah. All right, so let's let's switch gears. You started writing. So I don't want to I don't want to misquote. I I want to say it's 19 years ago. The trends report. Am I am I accurate with that? Tell me tell me. Please give me the exact number. Yeah, right now. close enough. My my first book ever was my master's thesis that I did in yeah. 1988. That became a book. I published that in 1990. So the first book was 1990. So this year would be my 30 years of writing book. Yeah. My first book in the U.S. was 1998, so eight years later when I immigrated to the U.S., I wrote my first U.S. book, which was my fourth overall book. And the trends report I started 15 years ago, 2005. 15. This year was the 15th year, and the trends report this year was book number 52. Did you guys hear that number? Look at my team. I was just in an, uh, an author's mastermind in January in New York City with uh, Nir Ayel, who wrote uh, uh, Indistractable, and my buddy Todd Herman, who wrote The Alter Ego. 
And, you know, one had written his first book, one had written two books. And these guys are monster authors, massive bestsellers. And I remember saying, I got this pal who's written like 40 or 50 books already. And they were just like, 40 or 50 books? Talk talk about, like, for the person that maybe hasn't read the Trends Report and doesn't understand, you know, give them, give them some insight into what it takes to be able to write the industry trends. And then I think we should talk about some of the trends. And I really want to talk about, and I know the, the listener wants to know, what do we think the trends will be coming out of this? Going into the fall of 2020, 2021, 2022, right? I imagine you and your research team are already seeing early signs of what's to come. But, but first, give us a optics. Like, do you just sit down one day, smoke some weed, and say, I think this is how it's going to be? <laughs> Hell no. <laughs> Hell no. Um, the same way that everybody has, an, you know how agents sometimes get mad when the next door neighbor who's a medical doctor knows something about real estate and tells you, I know what's going to, I read yeah. that on Zillow, Redfin's going to do blah, 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 blah. Yep. And you go like, what the hell does he know? I'm in real estate. I've sold real real estate for, you know, for 10 or 20 or 30 years. I feel sometimes the same way when I talk to realtors or brokers and they go like, well, I've been in real estate for, you know, 10 or 20 years and I know a lot about real estate. Yes, you do. Yes, you do. But you don't as well. Because you've been running a business, you've been busy with your day to day stuff. I have for the last 25 years, been spending about two and a half thousand hours a year, every year for the best part of two decades, trying to understand real estate. So, so for me to understand something, Tom, thank you for thinking I'm smart. And I appreciate that. And I like to believe I am. But I sometimes spend 10 or 20 hours trying to understand one thing, just, yeah. just trying to get your head around it because you read something in Inman and you go like, what is that? What does yeah, it mean? Really? Yeah. really? This sounds contradictory. I've heard something else. I've heard a different opinion. This is confusing. I don't get it. Tomorrow I hear a different story. So for us to try and write anything, we, yes, we read Inman. Absolutely. I, if, I, if I was an agent, I would read Inman every day. But Inman is the news and the news is great, but it's the news. Inman does not have the time to spend 600 hours to research one topic or two yes. topics or three topics or four topics. That's what we sometimes take. Inman, I don't want to be a newspaper. I've said to Brad any times, you're the media, you're the news, you fill a very, very, very important role in the industry. I'm the, the McKinsey or, the, or the, um, uh, the Gartner or the Forrester, right? We're the company that takes something from Inman or something from a franchise or something from a brokerage or something from an MLS or association or NAR, which also published a lot of stuff. We look at it and we go like, so what the hell does this mean? How does this look like? Let's look at it from always to Sunday, right? Up and down. Let's get a second opinion and a third opinion. Let's dissect it. Let's look at the numbers. Are these numbers real? Are they, are they affordable? Are they digestible? Are they scalable? Can they grow? Is it funded? How much management do you need? Is it going to happen? Can the current team do it? Are they getting money? Is the money coming? Is the money which they got, is it enough? Is it going to last? Is the model going to last? Is there big enough market share? I mean, you ask all these hundreds of questions to yourself because I can't, I can't ask I can't answer the one question that Tom Ferry might ask me if I haven't asked those questions to myself and tried in my bestest, none of that's a word, bestest, ha, bestest to try and solve that, right? Now, again, do we have the answers to everything? Of course, like any good leader will say no, but Dan, do I know more about trends than you do? Oh, absolutely. What, why? Because you've not spent 2,000 hours for 20 years. I have. I, I don't think anybody else has. You know, there's maybe there's a handful of, you know, maybe Stephen Murray. So, so maybe there's a, there's a handful of other leaders that have done that. Who is Stephen Murray, just like us, is dedicated to the space yep. and has done lots of research. As a matter of fact, he's done it for a longer period of time than I have. So, so, but it's a handful of people that really, we are passionate about the industry. Uh, you know, it's like we will die for America. We'll die for the flag. I almost want to say I'll die for real estate. It is, it is my family. It is my life. It, I will never, ever do anything else. I never, I mean, not even, not even a shadow of a doubt. I mean, this is the space that I, for whatever reason, good, bad, indifferent, whether it was the NAR job, it doesn't matter whether I like you so much that I could never leave you alone in the industry because I'd, too, I'd be too scared about Tom Ferry Enterprises if I'm not here to help you. It doesn't matter what the reason is, right? Right. This is our space. So we research it. It takes us about 600 hours to research and write one trends report, which you can read in three hours or four hours. Yeah. So, so is it worthwhile? 
You'd be a bloody fool not to read it. Why would you not read it? Here is one of the smartest guys in the industry spending 600 hours to give you something which you can zip through in three or four hours. I mean, now again, if, if you're an average agent, if you want to be average, if you don't even have that's, a plan A, forget that, about plan B. Yeah, that's, not my, that's not my listener. No, no, no. Forget about yeah, the report. Yeah, yeah. The report's above your pay grade, right? Don't read it. Waste of time. But if, you, if you're serious, if you want to win, if you're a Tom Ferry follower, if you want to be on that top, top thousand list of the best agents, the best teams, the best companies, the best whatevers, mm -hmm. if you want to you know, do 100 million sales volume, if you want to make a million personal earnings, well, now you're competing against some determined people at the same level as you are. Now you've got to up your game. Now you can no longer be average. <laughs> yeah. You want to be top thousand or top 2000, whatever the number is, who cares? You've got to up your game. Now you do need a coach. Yeah. Now you do need to read the trends report. Now you do, you do need to sharpen your knife and your pencil and your skills on a regular, consistent basis. 100%. You need Tom Ferry the same way you need Stefan Swanpoel on a different level. You, need, you should have a, 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 a hunger, hunger for information, passion, and stats and, and, and help and support and mentoring. Absolutely a hunger. Yeah. And you know, so many people that I interview, I mean, I just had a uh, Mauricio uh, on, on, you know, my podcast. Right. And it's the same thing. Like you could just see that, like, even before the interview, what do you, what, 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 what's this, what's happening here? Like it's the, it's the, it's the curiosity that thrives and drives these people. So I want to hit you with, I want to hit you with a few questions. What do you think are the two or three most important trends that will impact agents going forward, coming out of COVID? Our research back to 1850 has strongly, strongly, strongly indicated that every 12 to 18 years, call it 15 as an average, every 15 years, a new concept, a new business philosophy, a new trend tends to come along in our industry. I'm not referring to 9-11 or Katrina or Sandy or COVID. I'm not referring to the collapse of Italy or Greece. I'm not referring to world economy, or gold price or silver price or mortgage rates. I mean, business specific, real estate specific, something gets innovated. Franchising was a new concept in the yes. 70s. Teams is a new concept. Yeah. The, 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 the way to use mergers and acquisitions and roll up to create bigger companies is a concept. Um, iBuyer is a concept. So, so every 10 or 15 years, these concepts are created by usually people that you and I know, people from in the industry, sometimes from outside the industry, they come with this idea. Most people think that these people are bloody fools and idiots when they launch them. We find them amusing. Edmund starts writing about them. They get some traction. People read about it. We start changing our minds and saying, oh, it's interesting, but it's never going to work. Then we badmouth them. Then they get a little traction. Then they either buy something, get some money, get some momentum. And here, around about year six, seven, eight, and you could see that with EXP. You could see that with Redfin. You can see that with Compass. Around about that time, again, differs from company to company, funding to funding, decade to decade, but around about that time, that company seems to get legitimacy. It seems to get legs. It seems to get momentum. And then when you get to around about year eight, nine, 10, these companies tend to pick up. And then around about uh, 10 years later, around year 10, they become part of the, the accepted, right? The, uh, Zillow was the enemy. Still, it's right. no longer the enemy. They are the industry. <laughs> I mean, they've not been around so long. They, yes. are, uh, they are as much part of the industry as anybody else's. Nobody can point to them and, and say that they are an outsider. They're not an outsider. They might have been in 2006 when they started. They're not anymore. So, so even, even, even Compass and EXP and, and HomeSmart and Realty One and Knock and Open Door Offer Quiet, I mean, they've been legitimized. They're, they're, they're part of who we are. So we've looked at all those stages. We are now, Tom, believe it or not, in the ninth iteration of a cycle or a stage of new, creating newness in our, in our industry. And this, this ninth stage, which we've tracked all the way back to 1850, the different stages, and I can pinpoint each one of you if you ever wanted to know, but this one started in our estimation approximately 2012. Now, there's no exact date because nobody, nobody shoots the gun and says, you know, the marathon starting. Yes, yeah, It's roughly, but in this stage was roughly bought. Uh, I said abort, born, uh, the compasses, the EXPs, the open doors, the offer pads, the, the red fins, those kind of what we would call new business models, innovative business models. Some of them are completely different. I would say like the iBuyer. Some of them are not too much of a difference. The, the Realty One or HomeSwap models are not that much different. You could even argue that the compass model, although they, although they got funded, 
is tr very much a traditional model with maybe some technology on top. EXP, more virtual, though we had virtual, they're completely virtual, so a little bit different. But it doesn't matter whether there's a small difference or a big difference. They got funded and they used technology. Those two things, they used money and technology yep. better or more extensively than any former generation of real estate company ever did. Now, we've always funded companies with money, we've always used technology, but we used it to five or 10 or 15% of our companies energy force we were we were limited you're talking about private equity you're talking about big money not not i i refinanced my house and started my real estate company we're talking about big money here big expectations big difference from remodeling your house by putting on a garage as compared to building the empire state building i mean yeah. this is not that they're both construction projects they're not the same you mm -hmm. can't even discuss them in the same breath so, so these new companies got, you know, the price tag of an Empire State Building. They, they got hundreds of millions and in a few cases, billions. You don't build a garage for a billion. I mean, you know, you can build a garage on your own dime. So, so these new companies took off like a rocket. Now, again, remember, a, a concept per se is not the winning silver bullet. A concept is merely a direction, a plan that a certain individual has for the vision of what he or she sees that vision to be. So whether it's Glenn Kelman or Glenn Sanford or Robert Rifkin or, or, or um, <clears throat> Eric Wu, they had a plan of what they thought the, the future was and they went on that path. And sometimes those paths met with resistance. <laughs> sometimes they got knocked down. Uh, sometimes they, they, they went well. Clearly COVID has hurt most of them. Not all of them. It, it seems like EXP is still doing well. It seems like Compass is still doing well. But but yes, of course, they got some headwinds. The iBuyer companies, the Open Doors Offer Pads got some headwinds. But we all got headwinds. If you look at the showing time statistics of, of March and April, yeah, the numbers came down like a off the cliff. Yep. But most of them have all picked up again, right? We've, we've, right. we've seen very much a check mark return to the market. And if you speak to, to Compass or Redfin or, 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 you know, instant offers from Zillow, whatever those are, Redfin, they're not gloomy. They're not negative. They're all positive. They all have strong confidence that their model is still alive and that they are ready to rock and roll when the market allows them to do so. And they're all thinking that it's going to be this summer. So I believe they're all back. Yeah. They're all still here. So it's interesting because I was on uh, both Redfin and then separately Zillow's earnings calls just, uh, I think it was about a week and a half ago. And both, both Rich and Glenn came out and said, yeah, we're buying houses again. And like, if, if you wanted a leading indicator that the market is back, it's two large publicly traded companies buying houses, trying to get it at a, a, you know, a reasonable discount and then putting a bunch of money into it and trying to sell it. You don't do that when prices are going down. You don't take good money, throw it into the toilet, then light it on fire and put more money into it. And like you, you with me, like, so we see that, but Stefan, as always, every time I'm with you, I've got already three pages of notes, 1850 to 2020, every 15 years, something new happens. You know, I think of franchise because, you know, certainly I know that Remax, right? Teams, iBars, you know, 100%, right? Remax, roll ups of big brokerage companies, um, six years before legitimacy, nine to 10 years before they're accepted. And then 15 years, they're a part of the fabric of, of the way we do it. And you're saying now it's the private equity in tech, but what do you think happens to how agents interact and how they transact? And, you know, where do you see that going in 2020 end of the year 2021 what are the what are the bets that agents need to be placing if you will in their business now to be ready for the future because that's what all my people want three three totally different angles to approach that i believe tom the first is that i think um human nature is <laughs> it doesn't change easily and we are very stubborn as a people and we will go back to our bad habits, right? That's why dieting and stopping to smoke and losing weight and all those things are relatively hard for more majority of people. So I think many of the bad habits that we may have had or the, the less than healthy habits or the less than, than social distancing habits, I think we will probably forget about some of this stuff in the not too distant future. That's one big chunk. A second chunk, which I think we will carry over Yes, we do now have a better understanding of concepts like social distancing, which we've never had. Um, so yes, we will probably keep some level of Zooming and video calling, 
I think I am no longer going to go to, you know, 100 events a year, Tom. If you're going to do it, God bless you. I'm not mm -hmm. going to. So yeah. I'm, I'm cutting my 100 trips down to probably 20. I mean, I'm going to cut it way back down. And I am only going to go to meaningful events and the really big ones. Not that I want to be derogatory to the smaller ones, but I, I will Zoom you or I will participate in, a, in another kind of a way. So right. I think less events, less travel is most certainly a carryover, which does mean we'll probably handle open houses a little differently we probably will have more video equipment we'll probably have more virtual tours we'll probably have a different way to allow people to get into the houses balance that with the fact that we still have this human nature of defaulting to what's the easiest right <laughs> because this other one requires me to come up with a whole new paradigm that's hard work that's effort <laughs> so I'm, I'm not sure which one will win i don't think it's a winner take all i think it's you know part of both and then i think the third one is i think we have to understand that that our buyer our consumer our seller he and she herself and himself have also changed. And therefore, not only is it what we as agent, whether we're, you know, Cobble Banker or ERA or Sotheby's or Berkshire Hathaway or, or whichever brand, independent, first, first team in your area, right? Any, any individual brand. Not only do we want to change, but our client has changed. So our client is going to probably say, you know what? If Corona 19 turns out to become, sorry, Corona 19 turns out to become Corona 20 or Corona 21 or 22, maybe I should think a little bit ahead and maybe I want a slightly bigger lot than I have now. Yeah. Maybe, maybe I want that extra room, which I wasn't sure I could afford because I'm going to be working from home more, honey. So I need that extra study. Honey, I, I thought I had to stay in downtown because we've always loved downtown. We've loved the, the bars and the pubs and the, and the, and the stuff. But, you know, I'm now ready for the, the suburbs. We thought we were going to go to the suburbs only 10 years from now. I'm so ready for the suburbs. I want that white picket fence and a, and a dog and a cat, right? So I do think that the consumers, again, only those that can afford it. Yeah. There are many consumers for which my heart goes out that are skinning by by their teeth and can't afford the luxury of choice. <laughs> They're forced into whatever comes their way. I am so sad for them. But that 10, 20, 30% of the market that can afford choice, I think is going to start changing the decision of maybe not staying in the, in the center of town, maybe not staying as much in a, you know, thousand square foot apartment. And if they can afford it, maybe looking for something with a little bit more breathing space with a study or a family room or something like that. Yeah. A home office, maybe <laughs> a home office, a pool. You know, it's interesting. I was, um, I follow, uh, you know, a lot of interesting characters on Twitter and Spencer Roscoff, who we both know, who I'm actually I invested in, I think two of his other, uh, you know, new ventures who I just think the world of super, super bright guy, super interesting. And obviously, you know, former uh, CEO of Zillow, um, he tweeted out the other day, kind of, do you think that, you know, buyer's expectations will change? Do you think seller's expectations will change? Do you think buying patterns will change? Something along these lines. And, and basically somebody made the point of, hey, look, after... 9-11 in New York, the hallucination was nobody is going to want to live downtown. And, and there was this sort of like mindset of everybody's going to leave the city. Everybody's going to leave the downtown environment. And, and guess what? None of that happened, right? Everybody is still busy down there. Apartments are selling every single day. People are moving it every single day. So, so I'm with you. Like, I do believe we're going to see some short term uh, behavioral changes of the demands of the people that have the ability to. But do you think that's going to be long lasting? Do you think that's going to become the new way or is it more, you know, if I'm, if I'm selling first time buyers that, you know, their, their needs are going to change, or if I'm selling luxury, I need to be thinking about the, the sort of demand of buyers and sellers. What are your thoughts? I don't believe that COVID created, um, uh, DocuSign COVID didn't create zoom no. COVID didn't create change. COVID did not create a need for a study. <laughs> All, all a pandemic or a, or a, or a terrorist attack or a, or a natural disaster does is it, it concentrates for a short period of time our attention onto certain negative things that impact our life in a terrible, terrible way and, and for which we now are, are fearful and have concern and trepidation. Once that, that fear anticipates and goes away, we gradually return to our normal way of life. And but a small percentage of the population carry with that a long-term effect, I think. Is there a percentage, again, as I said, no black or white, your life is gray. Yeah. So will yeah. a percentage carry with 
the fact that they lost a family member or they worked in a hospital for the period of time. Absolutely. Their impact is way worse than my impact. My, I don't have one family member that t t tested positive, not one. So, so I don't even have a staff member that tested po uh, positive. So, so although I could see the news like everybody else does and, and I can say I have empathy and I, I'd like to believe I do and, and you donate and you give some time and charity, I did not feel COVID the same way that somebody who lost a family member or tested positive or was under quarantine personally for a period of time. So I'm sure those people will, will respond differently to, yes. to COVID than you and I will. But I think the majority, uh, Tom, I have to think that we will probably go back to our old habits and probably do largely what we did before. Yeah, yeah. And it may be different. You and I are on the same page. Like, you know, I, I think to myself, do I really want to go to a movie with my wife and sit six feet away? Probably not. You know what I mean? But, you know, do I want to go to the Laker game? Do I want to go to a sporting event? Do I want to go to a football game? Do I want to experience all these things? The answer is yes. And I think the vast majority of people are, are they can't wait to go experience that stuff. Do I want to have a birthday party for my son? Do I want to, you know, be surrounded by my friends on my birthday? The answer is yes, yes, yes. And I think, you know, again, it's all context specific. I have, as you know, friends in New York City, uh, friends in Hoboken, New Jersey, you know, friends in Italy that, that they experience this dramatically different, dramatically different. And yet I would say the same thing, man. I, I would bet everything on the human race. Oh, me too. Absolutely. So Not a shadow of a doubt. Yeah. I, I would take any bet on the human race. So, so yeah, no problem at all. I think what COVID has done or the pandemic or Corona or this, this unique circumstance we find ourselves in, it has accelerated certain paths, shifts or changes yeah. that were already evident. Yes. So, so we were already moving strongly towards a more virtual, like a more online, like yes. a yes. more technology driven. So, so COVID has just actually proven to everybody and said, guys, those of you which were on the fence, get over on the other side. It, this yeah. works. Yeah. Um, but I don't think it, it really created many new shifts. It accelerated shifts yeah. that were already in place. And therefore, I think that once the scare goes away, we will largely return to what the momentum and the pace was, call it end of last year, beginning of this year, and we'll get back into that groove. We might have lost nine months in between, you know, a pregnancy in between. So maybe we lost that in between, but we'll get back to where it, it was. And I think the real estate industry will be one of the industries that will actually show a better return Yes. meaning return to normality, I, I fear more for airlines. I mean, I mean, so there yes. are many hotel Hotels. industries. Yes. yes, yes. There are other industries which are 10 times worse off than we are. Yeah. Real estate, yeah, guys, we got hurt. Put a bandaid on it and get up and start running again. The marathon is not over. It's yeah. not over. Yeah, I mean, if you think about it, if you put it in that context, if you say the worst that I have to do is now wear a mask, put on gloves, and do a Zoom session, you know, versus a listing presentation. Uh, contrast that, uh, one of my neighbors in Dallas is the former CEO of American Airlines, and I can't wait to see him in a couple of weeks to talk to him about, you know, what they're experiencing. Imagine, you know, being an airline pilot today. You know, you, you know I live near the airport in, in Orange County and used to see about every 15 minutes a flight taking off, and now you sit there and it feels like it's about every hour or so and sometimes two hours. And you think about the hundreds of thousands of people that impacts. I do believe it'll get back to normal, just like after 9-11, it got back, like people started flying again. I think we're gonna get there. But yeah, the context of in this industry, I think we're doing way better than most. You, you said I remember numbers, the fact that you referred to American Airlines and LM flight. I saw that roughly at the peak of flying last year, if you just take an average month, month of last year, about 2.5 million people flew in the US per day. 2.5 million round numbers just to give you, yeah. you want to frame that. So that's roughly the number of licensed agents in our industry. Yeah. So, so yeah. 2.5 million. Uh, last month was roughly about 100,000 a day. That is only barely the size of, let's call it, I don't mean a derogatory, but I mean that is barely, basically the size of a Remax or let's say a half the size of a Keller and Agents, right? Or it's even a little bit more than a Berkshire Hathaway. Yeah. So, so from all realtors, or even realtors, all licensed agents, we're down to just Berkshire Hathaway number of agents. That's how that industry has consolidated in 60 days. Yeah, yeah. 
I think everybody should just uh, count their blessings if you're in this industry. That would be my, my, my sort of thought on that. So, Stefan, you know, you and I could probably spend about 11 more hours, you know, just talking and dissecting. But I want to go back. I think your, your insight around um, for everybody to think about 1850 to 2020, that was, I mean, I've heard you say that before, and I believe you wrote a book on this too, and I know I've got it. Um, I think it's important for people to check you guys out. So, t360.com. Uh, is that, is that the best site for them to go to, or just to Google you? What's, what's the best way if they want to like learn more, read more, understand more? I, I think we have about 20 URLs. <laughs> you yes. know, I get confused. Uh, so usually, uh, yeah, T360 and you can spell out 60 or you can do the numbers. So it can be T360.com is, is, a, our sort of a corporate kind of holding site. It's not a very yeah. salesy site. It's a little bit more corporate, but it gives you a good overview. It's a, I mean, it's a, I say McKinsey site, it's a, it's a boring site. It doesn't have a lot of video. It doesn't have, it's not a salesy site. If you wanted uh, things on the trends report, then, then go to, you know, uh, T3 trends, easy to find T3 trends. If, if you want the almanac, go to real estate almanac. If you want the mega 1000, go to mega 1000.com or SP 200. Yeah. So we tend to create a, a, a landing page or a website for every one of our brands, which are well known. Um, Swanapple trends report is a brand mega 1000 is a brand and we always do just.com. And we never do hyphens or misspellings. It's always mega 1000. As you say it, as you see it, that's it. Dangerreport.com, realestatealmanac.com, straightforward. And those will give you more insight into that specific product, that specific niche. T360 is the the big picture. Got it. Well, this is always, you know, super valuable to spend time with you. And I know, you know, looking, uh, looking at that golf course, I wish I was there, but it looks like it might be raining right now in Kauai. Am I seeing that correctly? Love it. But that's the beauty of Hawaii. It can be raining and then you're also getting a suntan within, you know, 35 or 40 minutes. So, so Stefan, as we wrap this up, um, you know, you get to talk a lot to the industry and the, and the industry listens intently when you talk. Um, what would be the last thing you'd want to share if this was the last podcast, the last speech, the last talk of 2020? What's the last thing you'd want to share? Hold on to integrity, remain honest, be passionate about what you do, do it fairly, do it logically, and power yourself to victory. The market has dropped uh, in Q2 as a result of the circumstances we find ourselves in. I think Q3 is going to get us damn close back to normal. I understand that there's a lot of things that can impact that. And I think by the time we tally up Q4, I think we are going to be maybe 10 or 15% under for the year 2020 as compared to 2019. Um, I don't think it's going to be a disastrous year. I think there will be a dip because Q2 was, was mm-hmm. rough. It was tough. And, and we will still feel that for a while. But I think that you can look forward with optimism to a decent Q3 and a strong Q4, despite seasonal adjustments. And 2021, if we don't have a COVID next year, I think 2021 is going to be a fantastic year. I agree. Well said. And I like the beginning. Integrity, honesty, you know, hard work, passion, so much of what makes what all of us get to do so special. So thank you, my friend. And as I wrap it up, um, listen, you know, a lot of thought provoking discussion here. Interesting to get into Savon's background to understand, you know, who this guy is and what makes him tick. And, and certainly we could have spent, you know, many, many more hours. Certainly recommend you go check out all of his work. Uh, I have every one of the trends reports. It is that one thing that so many CEOs, myself included, and smart agents and team leaders that want to stay on the pulse. It, he said it's not for everybody. It's for the people that want to do big things because you know at the big thing level, you are competing way more than just trying to sell a few houses now and then. So absolutely recommend you check that out and you know follow him on Instagram and social and all that good stuff as well. So thank you as always as we wrap it up. Uh, you know, Give us a heart, give us a like, give us a share, give us a comment. You know that means the world to us on this podcast. And I'll look forward to seeing you guys soon. Take care.